Awesome. Hey, thank you guys so much for being here this morning. Uh, can I get just a round of applause for our students so far? This, I mean, they're really knocking it out of the park. Also for the graduates, I just want you to know that's not a small feat for graduating high school or graduating college, even masters. So can we give them another round of applause too for their efforts and what they have earned? Hey, I would like to take a minute and say thank you to my church family. Um, the many prayers that are sent our way in the student ministry are definitely felt and they're definitely heard. There's no way that we would be able to do what we do on Wednesdays and Sunday nights without you. Just knowing that you guys have our back, just knowing that we have just the comfort and strength that you guys give to us through prayers and your thoughts are just awesome. So I just want to say thank you to that. Parents, thank you for allowing us to have your students on Wednesday and Sunday nights. Now, you may know today's time, it's very scary out in the world. Uh, what we would learn so much farther along in life, we're learning now in middle school and elementary school. And so if we don't get, a, get these students soon, they're going to be learning things from the world that we should be teaching them at church. And so thank you so much for allowing us to have your students on Wednesday and Sunday nights. And I pray uh, that we are just falling in tune with God's heart and teaching them the things that he wants us to teach. And so thank you once again for doing that. You see, it's our mission to share the word and the only word uh, that is alive and still breathing today as it was 2,000 years ago. Uh, it is Christ that we set our eyes on in the student ministry and only his wisdom that we ask to bring through every lesson that we teach your students. Uh, so from the top of the bottom, thank you guys so much for allowing us to do that. Since it is graduation Sunday, uh, I felt like it was needed to give kind of a little encouragement to the graduates, but I also wanted to take time and spread, some, uh, spread the word to all of us today, including myself. So when I jokingly say you better bring your steel toe boots, I had to strap mine on this morning as well, uh, because what I felt led to share from God today is something that I have to continually remind myself each and every day that I wake up. And it's all about choices, as the video said. Um, so I, I, I pray uh, that we can just go straight through it um, and, and just make some good and wise choices. Uh, but that's what I want to share on today. It seems the older that we get in age, the more choices that we are faced with. I can remember as a young kid, my parents always saying, if you think that life is difficult now, if the choices that you got to make are, are hard now, wait until you get into the real world and then see the choices that you've got to make. I understand now what they mean. Uh, we are faced with making decisions each and every day. Uh, what food we'll eat, that's a tough one, especially if you're leaving out Sunday morning at church and your wife, where do you want to go eat? I get it. It's, it's a tough one sometimes. What clothes we'll put on, how we will spend our money, where will we live, what school we will attend, what career choices we will make, who we will marry, and how and who to spend our time with. The list continues to go on and on through everyday life. There was a study done not too long ago at Columbia University. Uh, the study was on the amount of choices that a, a human being makes daily. Uh, to their surprise, and I think to everybody's surprise, a human being makes 70 choices on average a day. Now, that may not seem like a lot, uh, continue, you know, just seeing what kind of choices we have to make, but when you put it in a year span and in a lifespan, yearly we roughly make 25,500 choices. In a 70-year lifespan, you're looking at roughly 1.8 million choices that we make in a life. Each choice counts each choice matters. John C. Maxwell says it best, I think. He says, life is a matter of choices, and every choice you make makes you. Life is a matter of choices. Every choice you make makes you. I can remember many years ago the popularity of the WWJD bracelets. I'm sure if I asked people here today, they would say, yeah, I've got one in my Bible, or I've got one on my wrist, I still wear it. And these things are widely and widely known, I mean, people still uh, use these things for everything today. If you're under the age of 18, let me just tell you what it stands for. It's what would Jesus do? Um, I'm sure that you guys probably already knew that, but I'm sure somebody may not have. Um, but what would Jesus do in the early 90s was on pretty much every Christian t-shirt, every hat, every backpack. Everything seemed to have the four-letter words, WWJD. They were a hot commodity back in the day. Because it was a sure reminder that when we were faced with tough and difficult decisions, we could rest and consult the all-knowing. For example, I can either get strawberry ice cream or chocolate. I don't know what to do. What should I do? Oh, what would Jesus do? He'd probably go strawberry. Or my favorite one. I can either go to La Fonda's or I can go to El Charo's. That's a tough one. What would Jesus do? Well, I'm almost for certain that he would choose El Charo because Jesus is not from Harrisburg because that seems to be the way that it goes around here. 
in all seriousness, in all seriousness, when we find ourselves in tough decision-making scenarios, it was a breath of fresh air to think, if Jesus was in my situation, what would he do? I've always selfishly pondered the, pondered the question, what would Jesus do, and the bracelets for, for my difficult decisions, uh, because to me, the same stuff that I went through 2,000 years after Jesus lived is not the same stuff that he went through. And I always wondered, man, why would, I'm consulting, what would Jesus do? I guess I'm just using it as like, what would he do if he lived in my day? Uh, you know, I just, I don't know. And some of the decisions that I, that I would have to make. But it wasn't until recently that I'm able to answer my selfish question as to what would Jesus do and what the bracelets truthfully mean. Uh, I answered it in a way that I did not expect. You know, Jesus doesn't merely give us the exact answer to the questions that we need. Jesus isn't going to say he could, but he, he most of the time is not going to say yes or he's not going to say no. Jesus taught us how to determine the decisions that we would need to make. He didn't tell us the decisions that we needed to make. He led by example. And Peter, the second chapter, verse 21 says that Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. In like manner, when we are faced with difficult decisions in life, we should follow the example that Jesus left for us. An example that Jesus took very seriously so that when, we went to, when he went to be with the Father, we would learn by his leading how to discern his, father will, his Father's will for our own life. This morning, I want to share with you the steps that Jesus took when he needed to make difficult decisions. Steps that I think we should pay close attention to. Because life is full of tough, hard choices that we will all need to make. It never ends. We will always make choices each and every day. So whether you are a graduate, a regular attender, or a guest today, we can all be challenged by the way of Christ our Lord. Would you guys pray with me? God, I just thank you once again for this day, Father, that you've given us. God, I pray that as we dive into your word today, Lord, as we talk about choices and the choices that we have to make in life. God, I pray that you challenge us in the way that your son chose. God, I pray that we can learn from him and his example that he gave us, a God that we can apply to our own lives, Lord, to make ourselves better. Lord, I pray it's not me speaking up here today, Lord, but it's you. God, I pray that you use me as the mouthpiece today, Father, uh, to teach and preach to all of us, including myself, Father. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So there's five things that I want to talk about today, about what I felt like Jesus did when he was in difficult situations, when he needed to choose. The first thing, Jesus chose. Looking back at the life of Jesus, when he was faced with many decisions, he made it clear that he was going to choose his decision. He may not have known what he was going to do, but he made it very clear that he was going to choose. He wasn't going to let any kind of peer pressure come in. We need to make the choice that we are going to make and take full command of the choices that we decide. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't consult wise people. As a matter of fact, I recommend that to people. You should consult wise people. They're, that's the reason why there's more wise people in the world today for that. I'm just merely saying at the end of the day, when the decision is made, it needs to be our decision. We are responsible for the choices we make in life. And we are also responsible for the choices that somebody else makes for us. And that's something that we need to remember. When I think about somebody in the Bible that needed to be strong with their decisions, I think of Joshua. Talk about a big task. As if taking over for Moses wasn't big enough, God was saying, look, I'm going to have you lead my people to their land. I hope you're ready. The decisions Joshua had to make, what his first steps would be as a leader, when to move from place to place, how to attack in certain battles. But what I find interesting is before Joshua took over his leadership reign, God gave him a charge. God gave him some words of wisdom. God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous, to not be discouraged or afraid, for the Lord your God will be with you. In like manner, when we choose to make the choices in life, we should be strong and courageous with our decisions. Knowing that if we seek after the guidance of God, he is with us through it all. We need to make the choice of choosing our own decisions early in the process. We need to be confident that God will give us discernment. Second thing I want to talk about, when Jesus needed to make decisions, he often excused himself from the world. Jesus withdrew from his decisions. 
from the whole situation. He withdrew from the world. He looked at the situation from the outside in. He wanted to search for discernment from his father on the matter at hand. Many times in the Bible, we see Jesus taken off to be alone. Luke 5, 16 says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. We're not saying that Jesus was a loner. Jesus just wanted to get away from everything. He wanted to hear his father clearly. And I think we need to do the same. A couple places to note that when Jesus withdrew, when he went into the wilderness for 40 days before beginning his ministry, he also prayed all night before choosing the 12 disciples. Any big decision that Jesus was going to have to make, he took himself out of the world to hear from his father and then came back into it. Not only did Jesus want full discernment from the Father, he wanted to make sure that his priorities were right. By taping, taking a step out of the world, by taking a step out of life for a moment, we can look at our lives and see where we are spending the most time, what our priorities are, and if we need to change things. When we don't withdraw from tough decisions or difficult circumstances, we tend to rush into a decision, and sometimes that decision could lead to an emotional choice. When we make emotional decisions, it is typically a situation we will never make but do because we are emotionally involved. It's important to withdraw, breathe for a moment, and make sure the choice we are making is wise. The third thing Jesus did was Jesus prayed. If you continue to read on in Luke 5, 16, you will note that Jesus not only withdrew to lonely places, but he also spent time in prayer. If Jesus thought it was important to pray through situations and decisions, it's probably in our best interest to do the same. We have a lifeline straight to God when we need it, 24-7. We know and can sit on the truth that he hears our request. We shouldn't take that for granted. We should live our life as a prayer to God. Now, majority of the time, I myself do something that I'm not very proud of. I rush into this step. I don't withdraw, and I don't decide that I'm going to make the choice. I just rush into the prayer when something happens. You know, God, this just happened. Uh, what do I do now? What do I need to do? I need something real quick. God, can you answer me now? I'm getting impatient. Something's about to happen. Or God, can you send me a way out of this situation? I think it's important that we don't rush into that. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. When we go through tough and difficult decisions or times in our lives, they are important to us. God wants us to understand that they are also important to him. As parents, we do no justice to our children by giving them the answer every single time that they ask. We don't. Because we need to be raising up children that when they are adults, they know how to make their own decisions. They know how to make their own choices. In like manner, God doesn't do that for us. He gives us free will. But what God does is he gives us a way to discern his will for our lives. And a way that we do that is by praying to the Almighty. Be still and know that he is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the all-knowing. When we are praying for specific answers or how to handle tough decisions, we are really praying for wisdom. We're praying for wisdom in a certain situation. In James 1 to 5, we read, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to those without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God may not audibly give you a yes, do that, or a no, stay away, but what he will do is put discernment in your heart from the Holy Spirit to help God and direct you through decisions. I had a, a moment in my life that I want to share with you guys today whenever um, I had to seek after and search and pray for God for some discernment. As a matter of fact, it was right before I took the job here as a youth pastor some six years ago, I don't know, almost six years ago, kind of crazy. Um, but when I was at college at Moorhead State, I had always felt the calling to be a student pastor. Didn't know how, didn't know where, but I always wanted to be the student pastor at my home church. I always thought that that would be cool. My student pastor had a big um, involvement in my life, and I wanted to do the same. So to make a long story very short, my last semester at college, an opportunity arose. There was a youth pastor job opening up. So I came down. I actually moved myself back to Moorhead, um, applied at the job, and they actually gave me the job. They offered it to me. And so what I did is I said, you know what, give me a second. Let me pray about it. But the selfish Jacob was saying, let me pray about it so I can think about it a little more. I didn't want to do much praying. But God had other plans. Because the more that I prayed about this situation, the more I prayed about the decision of being the youth pastor there, the less and less peace in my heart that I had. And I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know if it was Satan trying to attack me, saying, this ain't the route to go, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I just wasn't hearing God's voice clearly. But the more and more that I prayed, the louder and louder 
I felt something in my heart saying, this is not right. It came full circle whenever I met with my pastor, uh, my childhood uh, best friend's dad. Sat down with him and I said, look, I just have no peace in my heart. Tell me it's from Satan. Tell me that everything's good. Tell me that, you know, I'm ready to accept it. I just, I just for some reason, don't have peace in my heart. And I'll never forget, the pastor looked at me and he said, Jacob, I'm so thankful for you. He said, but what you're feeling in your heart is from God. He's trying to teach you two things. One, you need to be still and listen to what, his, what your heart says. And two, he has different plans for your life. And the discernment is what you feel in your heart, whether you do or what you don't do. So you need to obey what Christ and what God is trying to say to you. Which leads me to my fourth thing. Jesus obeyed his Father. Jesus chose, Jesus withdrew, Jesus prayed, Jesus also obeyed. And we must obey God. We obey God by staying in the Word, keeping it fresh in our hearts. As Jesus made his decisions with a commitment to God, we need to do so as well. I love this conversation that Jesus had with the disciples in John 4, right after talking to the Samaritan woman. This is what it says, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? They were concerned with literal food for Jesus. Jesus, overhearing this, says, Listen, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Jesus' food that he was talking about was to obey the Father. It was above everything else in life. It was his number one priority. When Jesus felt led to do something from the Father, he did so. It didn't matter the peer pressure that was surrounding him. Even the disciples thought they were looking out for his best interest. But he wasn't looking as to what other people thought his best interest was. He was looking to see what God's interest for him was, what God's will was. We need to gain an attitude that we will always obey the directives and guidance of God in making decisions. We can gain this attitude by studying the scriptures and seeking God's will and obeying the Father with any decision that he gives us. If we read on in in James chapter 1, verse 6, it says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. We must obey the directives from God even when we selfishly think otherwise. Remember, we are still human. I get this wrong sometimes. We sometimes get this wrong, but one way to make better choices and staying in tune with God is by obeying His saying, is obeying and staying in His word and seeking His will. The last thing and probably the most important thing that I feel like Jesus did in His decision making was Jesus declared His choice. He didn't shy away from it. When He felt the will of God talking to Him, Jesus said, this is what I'm going to do. The story of the adulterous woman is one that I continually play over in my mind. And I think about when Jesus declared a decision that he was going to make. Another declaration, Jesus was, uh, declaration of Jesus was when he told the disciples, it is better for him to leave, to leave and go to the Father than it is for him to stay with them. In both situations, there were upset people with Jesus and the choice that he made. However, Jesus was in tune with the will of God. And the final step in his process of decision-making was to to declare that to everyone. No matter what his peers would say, no matter what his enemies would think, Jesus was only concerned with his Father. Let's look at James 1, 5 through 6 one more time. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. First thing that comes to my mind is Peter stepping out of the boat. He knew that was God, but when God asked him to come out, Peter's faith started to waver, and he started to sink. When we have a decision that we need to make and have to come to a conclusion that is in tune with God's will for our lives, we must powerfully declare it. We don't need to doubt. We don't need to be scared. We need to be strong. We need to be courageous, because if we don't, and we start to doubt our decision that we have from the will of the Father, we will start to waver, and we will not be all in as we should. As we read in the latter part of verse 6, that is a scary place to be. Declaration will help us stay true to our decision no matter what opposition we receive on earth. Christ chose to choose. He withdrew himself. He prayed, he obeyed, and he declared. I believe if we made all of our choices with this formula... 
we would follow in tune with God's heart for our lives. His will would become our will. We will cut down on the emotional decisions that we make, and we will learn from them. We can be confident in our decisions that we, we make. And most importantly, we will have God on our side, guiding and directing us. That's a win-win situation in my mind. Now, let me re- reiterate, I struggle with this sometimes. We all struggle with this, with the choices that we make. But we may struggle with choices we have made in the past, but God is our Redeemer. We may be struggling with the decision that we are currently making. It's not too late. Seek the Lord's will. He can overturn the decision. You may be making a decision right now that is emotionally attached. Seek after the will that God has for you in, his situa- in this situation, and I bet he will put discernment in your heart as to how to handle any and every situation that you find yourself in. Choose, withdraw, pray, obey, declare. Before we close out today, I want to share a story about the daredevil of Niagara Falls. There should be some pictures of him coming up here. Yeah, it was back in the day before they had uh, cameras and all that stuff. So it's kind of old stuff. But the story is true and it's good. His name was Charles Blondine. Some of you guys may know him. He's known as the greatest tightrope walker. One of his greatest accomplishments was walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He not only did it once, but many, and he did it in many different ways. Blindfolded, in a sack, pushing a wheelbarrow, carrying a man on his back, just to name a few. After completing one of his feats with a wheelbarrow, Charles Blondine went to the crowd and asked, How many of you believe that I can put a person in this wheelbarrow and push him across the rope? They all cheered and believed. Then he asked for a volunteer, and everybody went quiet. (laughs) Then out of nowhere, a person from the crowd walked out and got into the wheelbarrow and trusted him. You see, there is a difference between the man in the wheelbarrow and the rest of the crowd. In regard to God, have you made the decision of where you are? That one decision, that one choice that we will all have to make. Let's look at Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Jesus very clearly tells us that we have a choice to make. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it. You see, it's easy to stick with the crowd. Christ clearly tells us that many people take the easy route in life. They choose the wide gate to go through. But what Christ wants for us is to get in the wheelbarrow with him, allowing him to lead us through life, the will that he has for each and every one of us. We are called to stand out from the crowd and take the small gate, the road less traveled from the world's standards. Have you made that choice yet? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but if you have and you're not living the choice or you're not living out the choice of following Christ, allow me to share another verse with you that Christ shares with us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Christ just doesn't call us to be baptized. He calls us to live a life that is sold out for him. Making decisions than what we made from our life before Christ. And continually seeking the will of God through all of our decisions. I think Billy Graham says it best. Not every, or being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ sit on the fence one, one leg in the world and one leg with God God's not interested in that in my mind that's what he's saying depart from me because God just doesn't call part of our life God just doesn't call us to come in here on Sunday mornings to hear from him and then we're good for the rest of the week we can do whatever we want instead God calls us to live 24-7 for him to follow in tune with his heart and what he has for us. Are you choosing the choices that are in his will for your life? 
Church, let me ask you, are you in the wheelbarrow or are you with the crowd? We all have that choice to make. As we start to close, I would like to take a look back at the life of Joshua, the great military leader. This was towards the end of Joshua's life. He knew that he was about to die. And he decided that he wanted to call all the tribes of Israel, come to me. I have one last thing that I have to tell you. One thing that is very important. You see, he's going to warn his leaders about their idolatry. He's going to tell them that the judgment of God will fall upon them unless they choose to live for the Lord. Joshua stands up brave. He stands up courageous and he stands up strong for God. And this is what he says in Joshua 24, verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Joshua's laying it out for him. He's saying, listen, if you want to live for Satan, if you want to live for this world, if you want to be halfway in, halfway out, then choose it. Be all the way in for the world. But I'm telling you right now, if you choose to go into the world, you're not going to have God's blessing. Your ways may be destructive. And what I love next is Joshua stands up like any great leader does, leading his flock. And he says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We all have that choice to make on who we're going to serve. Every single person here this morning will have to make a choice. You are either serving gods of materialism of the world or you are serving the Lord. Not on the fence. Not one leg in, one leg out. I ask as we close today, what choice have you made? You cannot have both. Christ is very clear about it. Maybe you've never made the decision to follow Christ. Today could be that day. Come down front and accept him and declare him as your personal Lord and Savior. Choose today that your household will serve the Lord. Maybe you have chosen to follow Christ and accept him as your personal Savior, but the choice you made then doesn't support the choices that you're making now. We would love to take a statement of rededication to pray with you personally. Declare that today is going to be different. Your house will serve the Lord. I ask, are you going to take a stand today? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about yours? Let's pray. God, I just thank you once again for this day, Father. I pray that as you challenge us today with your word, God, that you speak clearly to us. Father, that your word is always true. Father, I pray today as we go through this time of invitation that if anybody is feeling in their heart that they need to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray today is that day, God. God, work mightily in our, in our house of worship, work mightily in our county, work mightily in our world, Lord. We want to see another sheep come and find you. We want to see another sinner come and find you, Lord. We want to have the heavens rejoice and party in your name. So, Lord, thank you for this time. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. We got to stand with us.